Turn with me now to Proverbs chapter 3, verses 1 to 12. Proverbs chapter 3, and we'll be looking at verses 1 through 12. Reading from the New American Standard Translation. My son, do not forget my teaching, but let your heart keep my commandments. For length of days and years of life and peace they will add to you. Do not let kindness and truth leave you. Bind them around your neck. Write them on the tablet of your heart, so you will find favor and good repute in the sight of God and man. Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him, and he will make your paths straight. Do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and turn away from evil. It will be healing to your body and refreshment to your bones. Honor the Lord from your wealth and from the first of all your produce. So your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will overflow with new wine. My son, do not reject the discipline of the Lord or loathe his reproof. For whom the Lord loves, he reproves, and even as a father, the son in whom he delights. Let us once again seek God's help as we come to his word this evening. Let us pray. Our God and our Father, those are really magnificent words to be able to say, let us pray. They're fearful words, for we're saying that we're coming into your presence, the God of heaven and earth, the holy God, in whose presence no sin can dwell. And yet they are very glorious and encouraging words for the Lord Jesus Christ through his own uh, tearing of his body has made a way of access into your presence, and therefore we can approach you boldly. And since all of the promises are yes and amen in Christ, the promise to grant your spirit to those who ask, the promise to give wisdom to those who ask, the words that are written throughout the Psalms, that your word would be a lamp to our feet and a light to our path, are filled with great richness and confidence because we can stand upon them and in Christ's name plead with you that you would fulfill them this night as we draw near to you and ask that you would draw near to us and teach us as we come to your word. Please, Lord, help us as we study your word. May your word be a light that would enter and then shine upon our hearts to guide, to convict, to comfort, to encourage, to accomplish what you alone can do as the God who knows each one of us in our need. Please come and minister to us as we study your word together. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, when I heard what Pastor Chansky was going to preach this morning, I wondered if I'd have any fuel left tonight. For I was going in a very similar track in terms of application and in terms of, of thought. So if there's any duplication, it's probably because what he said that was good stuck on me and it's coming out again. But we're coming tonight to a passage which is very familiar to us. And I trust it will be an encouragement, if nothing else, to reflect upon an old friend. In uncertain times, people are looking for sound advice as to how to weather the storm. Just listen to the radio and hear how many different ads there are to deal with the financial storm we are presently in. This company can make money in any market. That company can invest your money and make all kinds of cash. This one will get you out of debt. That one will help you in this way. 
There are many who say they have the wisdom necessary to help in the financial storm. Or if you're facing physical trials, health difficulties, family problems, relational challenges, there is a cry for wisdom. People looking for direction and help, guidance and advice. And many recognize that the Bible is a place that we can go to find such advice. The Bible's a good book. It's got some good things to say. And the book of Proverbs is especially helpful in giving that kind of ed helpful advice for life. It is one of the books which, is most, which most evidently contains that kind of advice. It's been very hard for us as preachers to do the evening reading because there's so much application from the book of Proverbs that can be brought forward and applied. But we've restrained ourselves, or at least we've tried to. It contains many pithy statements which give sound, practical, earthly counsel, earthy counsel on numerous issues. One man describing the book of Proverbs says we shouldn't view the book of Proverbs as though it were a priest or a pastor giving explicit religious instruction, but in a more common way. He then went on to say, wisdom from the book of Proverbs calls across to you in the street about some everyday matter or point, points things out at home. It functions in scripture, it as excuse me, its function in scripture is to put godliness into working clothes. <coughs> to name business and society as spheres in which we are to behave ourselves as if for the Lord, and in which we are to look for his training. Thus the wisdom of Solomon and the others found in the book of Proverbs is more than just a set of rules, more than just some nice counsel, some principles that if followed will be a 12-step process to happiness and prosperity. The wisdom of Proverbs includes detailed directives regarding how to live one's life, one's daily life for the Lord. And that's why I want us to consider this familiar passage in Proverbs chapter 3 this evening. Now the first thing I want you to note as we come to this section of Proverbs is the ordinariness of this passage. The ordinariness. Notice the ordinary agents spoken about that are the ones who impart wisdom. The ordinary agents, parents. Parents speaking to sons, daily wisdom being imparted to them. Very ordinary concept that most of us are very familiar with. Now clearly the daily wisdom being imparted here is speaking of more, or excuse me, those imparting it are more than just parents. The book of Proverbs speaks of all kinds of counselors and counselors in general. It speaks of those with gray hairs on their heads being people that we ought to listen to. They're ordinary agents by which we gain the experience and the advice that we need. And some of those with those gray or white hairs on their head have gained that experience just because they've lived long in the earth. And they could say to this or that circumstance, I've lived long enough to see how these kinds of things work out. I've lived long enough to tell that this is a good thing to do in that kind of circumstance. There are others that have gray hairs, if you will, not because they have lived long in the earth, but because their specific experience is in the sphere where you're looking for advice. And so their gray hairs are experiential, if you will. I've worked in that field. I've been married. I've faced that circumstance, and therefore they can impart or be the means to impart proverbial wisdom, but very ordinary agents. 
Now we need to recognize that behind all these ordinary agents is the God who uses them as his agents. Proverbs chapter 2 and verse 6, very early on in this book, states it very plainly. Jehovah gives wisdom. From his mouth come knowledge and understanding. So though we're hearing our parents, though we're hearing a counselor as it's coming to us through the scriptures in particular, we are hearing the voice of God. It is obvious that the Lord is the one who is viewed as imparting wisdom. It's obvious, isn't it, when uh, the parent says, if you do this, you'll live long. Well, he can't ensure, no parent can ensure that their child will live a long life, that we might like to. No parent can say, do this and you will be healthy the rest of your life. So the very promises that are made in this passage indicate that there's somebody else standing behind these words than just the parent but the, but the passage is, is just ordinary. It's meant to just bring us right into the, the sphere that this is ordinary life where this wisdom is being imparted. It's God imparting it, but through ordinary agents. The finding of proverbial wisdom for the challenges of life is not some mystical or magical process. It's an ordinary process by which ordinary people can get the wisdom that they need for ordinary daily life. That's what we're supposed to feel as we come to a passage like Proverbs chapter 3. And then I want you to note the ordinary response that's given to, this, to these ordinary agents. They are to listen and obey. Keep and not forget. My son, do not forget my teaching. But let your heart keep my commandments. Very ordinary, very typical, very earthy kind of response. You are to keep the things I tell you. The word literally means to guard, to treasure up, to protect. But obviously when you're guarding, protecting, or storing up commandments, what are you supposed to do? Children, do you write down every command that your parent ever gets, gives to you and put it into a little box somewhere and say, ah, I'm going to save that. Mommy, Daddy told me this is what I'm supposed to do, and that's precious. No! Your parents would say, what are you doing? Right? Commandments are to be obeyed. So when he says that these are to be kept, it means that they are to be obeyed. They are to be followed. And he says they're not to be forgotten. Now God knows our weak minds. God knows, I believe, one of the effects of the fall is that our minds are like sieves. And things just seem to immediately go through. He's not talking about the weakness of mind here. He's talking about the sinful neglect. The sinful carelessness. The sinful despising of the directive that is given. We are not to forget these things. We are to hold them tightly that we might obey. It's the, focus of earn, it's the principle of earnest effort to be given to the commands that are given to us. This is the ordinary response. Listen to my words and do them. Very ordinary. This is the path, this is the place of proverbial wisdom. But then there's another part in verses 3 and 4. Do not let kindness and truth leave you. Here's a second part of the ordinary response. Be kind and true, if I can simplify it. Or be merciful and faithful. Here is the typical proverbial response. You're to hear what your parents have to say, and you're to embody these things. Here are the two characteristics. Be kind, show mercy. The word literally is chesed. Extreme mercy even to those who don't deserve it or who deserve the exact opposite. Go out of your way to show that kindness to others. Kind of remind you of Paul's words, thinking of others as more important than yourself. And truth or faithfulness, that is, act not only in kindness toward others, don't not only make this a character trait that you have, but be sincere, be honest, be faithful. 
Embrace absolute truth. Believe the truth. Speak the truth. Know the truth. He says that these two things, these two characteristics in our ordinary response are to be like a necklace that we bind around our neck. It's the picture of adorning oneself with something that one wants to display. I want people to see this. Or it may be that it's something of a signet ring. Like we put the, like the, the ambassador puts the ring of the king on. He says, I stand for the king. And it may be that the necklace is that of I belong to the king. Because notice these two characteristics are two characteristics which mark our God. Chesed, faith, mercy, and truth or faithfulness. We are to so live in this world in an ordinary response to daily life. We are to so live that we reflect the character of God in mercy and in faithfulness. Many of the commentators point out that these two characteristics, as it were, are to sum up all of the other commandments. And if you live this way, you will fulfill your responsibility to your parents, to do what God has called you to do. You are to bind them around your neck. You are to write them, engrave them into the tablet of your heart. The inward is to motivate the outward. It is to be a deep engraving and keeping these things, laboring then to keep them. Is the ordinariness. Ordinary agents, parents, ordinary response, listening and obeying, being kind and being truthful and faithful, and an ordinary sphere. All that we have here are the basics of life. Right? He talks about the ever-ticking clock. These things will give length of days and years to your life. He speaks about relating to others. This will give you a good reputation with God and with others and with men. He speaks in verse 6 about making your way through life. Verse 8 about health and strength. Verse 10, finances and provisions. Verse 12, difficulties and trials. He's just talking about the ordinary life. The book of Proverbs is designed to give us proverbial wisdom through ordinary agents. We are to give ordinary responses in these ordinary, normal spheres of life. Proverbial wisdom is for everyday people every day. It is for something to be looked for. It is something to be looked for when going about daily life in your work clothes. Proverbial wisdom is not just something that you get and you use on Sunday in church. So that's the ordinariness of this text as we come to it. Second main point is this, the essential piety of this proverbial wisdom. The essential piety. Notice that after he tells them, here's your ordinary response, here's the ordinary agents, you're looking for proverbial wisdom in your ordinary life, here's what you're going to do. He doesn't immediately settle down to the workplace or the house, or the education, what does he do? Trust in the Lord, fear the Lord, honor the Lord, and do not despise the Lord's discipline. He goes right to piety, our relationship to God. And here is what is at the heart of proverbial wisdom. Now, if you're here tonight and you're not a Christian, Maybe you've picked up the book of Proverbs. Maybe you've been told by your parents. Maybe you've studied with your parents the book of Proverbs in your family worship. And you say, okay, that's the book I go to when I need a little pithy command. They're so easy, aren't they? Don't talk so much. You keep putting your foot in your mouth. Be sensible. Turn off the flow. That's the living Bible version of Proverbs 19.10. You can grab these things. And, oh, there's something. I can do that. That's easy, right? And you've done that. But let me tell you something. There's more to it than just grabbing little statements for how to live life that somehow now you can be a better person and have a better life and everything will be rosy and pleasant. The book of Proverbs has more to it than that. And it has at the heart of its very 
it's wisdom that it gives, this piety, this relationship to God, trusting in God, fearing God, honoring God, and not rejecting the discipline of God. And so I want to look at this essential piety. I want to look at these four points. The first is trust in the Lord. Trust in the Lord, verses 5 and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge Him. Here's the first part of this proverbial wisdom's piety. It is trusting in the Lord. It begins with an illustration as it gives its second line there. Not leaning on your own understanding. What does it mean to trust somebody? What does it mean for some of the uh, some of you who've ever had to, a hurt leg and you had to lean on your crutches or you had to trust your cane. What did it mean? It meant you leaned on it and it supported you. Well, that's what trust is here. Leaning on it, resting upon it, putting your whole weight upon it. He qualifies what this trust is. This is not just a half-hearted, piecemeal little bitty religious activity, I, I, I think about God once in a while, therefore I'm trusting in Him. No, trusting in the Lord is with all your heart. All your heart. From the depth of you, your entire being, it's an entire commitment of your heart, your thoughts, your affections, your will, all resting down upon God. And it's an intelligent trust. Do not lean on your own understanding, meaning you're going to be leaning on something else, somebody else's understanding or some other understanding rather than your own. You're going to acknowledge Him in all your ways. Literally, the Hebrew there means you are going to know Him in all your ways. And I've actually wondered, and at least one commentator said this may actually be part of the blessing rather than the requirement. If you do this, if you trust in God, you will know him in your way. But we know it as it's commonly translated, don't we? Acknowledge him in all your ways. Don't lean on your own understanding and your ability to sort things out. He says, trust in the Lord. Lean upon Him, not on your own understanding, your own limited knowledge of what's going on in life, but know Him in all your ways. This is what we were hearing about this morning from Psalm 46. That God alone has an exhaustive knowledge. As you go about your daily life, as you face these various aspects of the constant ticking clock that's behind you and worrying about your reputation as you relate to those around you and struggling with the health problems of life and wondering about how that healing is going to take place and where is my next paycheck going to come from and how am I going to meet this bill? And what do I do when this trial faces me that I can't understand? He says, trust in the Lord. Know Him in this. Know what the Lord requires of you as clear directive, clear obedience. What does He require you to do? Know it and have a conscious determination to do it. Know that as you go through these various things that the Lord is in control of all these things. How do you acknowledge the Lord in all your ways? Know that the Lord accomplishes the best ends, as we sang in one of our hymns. He knows what the best end is. And so I'm constantly giving thanks to God if I'm knowing Him in all my ways. There's a conscious commitment to Him in the midst of it, meaning I'm praying to Him on every one of these stages, looking to Him, trusting in Him, by coming with a conscious commitment, Lord, I'm looking to you as my very present help in time of need. I'm not looking anywhere else to hide. I'm looking to you. I am knowing you in this. I want you to walk with me as I go through these things. I will not be anxious, but I will pray in everything 
with prayer and supplication and with thanksgiving, I will make my request known to you. Here's the grace that I need. Here's the situation that I'm facing. And I will trust you to fulfill your promise, to give me that peace which surpasses all understanding and will guard my heart and mind in Christ Jesus. Trust in the Lord. Lean upon Him in an intelligent way, upon Him, knowing that He is the one behind all things, knowing He is the one that we have our confidence in that can bring us through. He is the one who is ordering all our steps, bringing everything to pass, knowing Him. And notice it says, in all your ways. It's not only an entire commitment with all my heart, it's an exhaustive commitment in all my ways. Proverbial wisdom does not have a piety which trusts in God one day out of seven. Proverbial wisdom for the daily man's life is wisdom which has a piety which in all the ways of life I'm trusting in Him, I'm knowing Him, I'm leaning upon Him. In every sphere of life, whether it's business, marriage, parenting, education, in every part of my life, whether it's the way I'm thinking about something, what I'm desiring to do, what I'm em how I'm emoting in a particular situation, what choices I make, it's all governed by Him. It's all being governed where my feet go, where my eyes look, what my mouth says. It's all being governed by an awareness. I'm looking to Him. He's walking with me. As we read in Proverbs 15, verse 3, the eyes of the Lord are in every place, seeing the evil and the good. That's what it means to trust in the Lord with all your heart and not lean on your own understanding. That's what it means to acknowledge Him, to know Him in all your ways, at least in part. But there's a second part to this essential piety. It's fear the Lord. Verses 7 and 8. Do not be wise in your own understanding. Fear the Lord and turn away from evil. It will be healing to your body and refreshment to your bones. Do not be wise in your own understanding. Do not be wise in your own eyes. We do have a real natural tendency, do we not, to navel-gazing? And when we're navel-gazing, don't we have a real good view of ourselves? It's like we look down, whoa, wow, all I see is my muscle. All I see is myself. Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty sharp. We tend to think highly of ourselves. We tend to be wise in our own eyes, looking upon ourselves. It's that magic mirror on the wall, you know, that you look at, and somehow it's like that morphing program on your computer, takes away all the wrinkles, takes away all the sags, takes away all of the idiocies, and, the, it, and it just smooths it all out. And isn't it wonderful? That's how we look at ourselves, isn't it? And for proverbial wisdom, the piety that we are to have begins by saying, no, I've got to be humble and honest in looking at myself. This is who I really am. I'm not going to think of myself more highly than I ought, but I'm going to have an honest assessment of myself. But that leads up to and that's part of this fearing the Lord. And this fearing of the Lord has a particular focus. Fear the Lord and turn away from evil. Now, fearing the Lord can mean many things. And it does mean many things. It's something of an umbrella grace in the Old Testament that's, that's immense in many of the things that it takes in. But here, the focus is upon turning away from evil. The piety necessary for proverbial wisdom in our day-to-day -day life has this perspective. I'm going to fear the Lord in such a way that I am going to avoid everything which is contrary to Him, His character, and His will. I am not going to go there. I'm going to turn away from it. I'm going to keep away far from her door, Proverbs 5 and verse 8. Keep your way far from her and do not go near the door of her house. 
of my favorite stories was this woman I worked for in the city. And if you've, if you've ever worked in New York City, you know this, that all the roads are on nice grids, right? Nice little square roads. Everything works pretty well. She lived in the city and worked in the city, and she was about three blocks from the workplace. And so she walked every day. And she was overweight, and she was trying to lose weight, and, but she wasn't making any progress. And I was talking to her about it one day, and she said, you know, every time I walk past that French bakery, it's, it reaches out and sucks me in like a Eureka vacuum cleaner. <laughs> And the next thing I know, I've got three eclairs and, and four French pastries, and I'm just sucking these things down. And I scratch my head, and I said, where do you live? I live here. Where do you work? I work here. Where's the pastry bakery? Here. <laughs> Don't go near her door. You can't be sucked in if you're not near the door. You'll avoid the temptation. I were certain corners I didn't walk down. I took a little extra time sometimes to avoid looking in certain places. I looked at some red shoes in one particular shoe store for a long time every time I came to one particular corner that I couldn't miss. It was, you know, it, it's not like she couldn't miss it, but she wasn't willing to. And you see, a lot of times, the fearing the Lord and turning away from evil isn't at the last minute with this heroic effort jumping over the great chasm. It's starting way back before I get to the cliff and saying, I'm going to go this way because there's a bridge down there. Turning away from evil means not going near her door. Not going near her corner. Not taking the way down to her house. Is it any wonder that in Proverbs 7, this naive man is met by this adulterous woman? Well, he was walking toward her house. Of course he met her. And his deceptive heart was already leading him down that path, and that's why he met her. Or he was so foolish that he did not stop and think, that's where the danger is. I will not go that way. But you see, the piety of this proverbial wisdom says, I fear God. I think of God too highly. I hold God in too great esteem. So I am going to turn away from anything that is going to lead me in a path contrary to his will or to his character. In the words of the psalmist, I will place no worthless thing before my eyes. I hate the work of those who fall away. I hate the, the apostate and the work that leads to apostasy. So I am going to avoid the first steps toward apostasy. I am going to flee youthful lusts. This is the piety that is essential to this proverbial wisdom that wears work clothes, that guides and directs us on a day-to-day -day basis when we're facing the clock, when we're worried about our health, when we're trying to meet the bills, when we're trying to figure out how to deal with this trial. Here is the second element, trusting in God and fearing the Lord, turning away from evil. And this is why it's so important that we not think of ourselves to as being too wise. Oh, I can handle that. Oh, oh, I, I can put a little shield around that. In my estimation of myself, that's not a problem. Do not be wise in your own eyes but fear the Lord. Keep your eyes on him and what he believes, what he knows is true and right. But the third element to this proverbial wisdom's piety, trust in the Lord, fear the Lord. And nine, verse nine, 
Honor the Lord from your wealth and from the first of all your produce. The word honor is the Hebrew word which means to treat as weighty. Give it its due and proper weight. Well, how weighty is God? Who fills heaven in the highest heavens and supports all things. Well, give him his due place, his due honor, his due weight. Do not treat him lightly. Do not take him and treat him as something small. Give him his proper place. Honor him. And then the writer of Proverbs, Solomon here, goes on and said, well, let me give you an example of exactly how you, you'll do that. Honor the Lord from your wealth or from your substance or from your basic possessions of life. Those things that you have as your daily needs, your daily benefits, your, your, your things. Honor him with those. Honor him from those things. Use them for his kingdom, for his purposes. This is commonly a verse used to, des to describe the giving of our tithes and offerings to the work of the gospel ministry. Honor the Lord by giving of your wealth to the advancement of the kingdom. Well, it certainly does have a right application there, but it goes farther than that. It's not just come in and put your 10% in the plate and, hey, I have honored the Lord with my substance. Well, no, the 90%, that's mine. I'm doing that for myself. No, you're to honor him with the 10% or whatever percentage you put in, and it can be much more than 10 or less. No, not less, but it can be more than 10. I don't want to go there. But it's honoring him with the other 90% too. What are you using that for? To meet my obligations, to provide for my family, good. To have to give to those who have need, great. What else? It's giving of that substance, using that to honor the Lord. Opening up your house to give place for people to stay, lending out that third car to somebody who needs a vehicle, taking those toys that you've been storing up and are stacked all over the shelves in your rooms and saying, you know what, I only need two of these, I don't need six, maybe I could give four to somebody else who doesn't have one. Taking those sub that substance and saying, you know, this is what I have, Lord, it's yours, what do you want to do with it? And then he says, from the first of all your produce, from the first fruits, which commonly speaks of the best, thinking of him in the priority, first place. The point here of this honoring the Lord from your wealth is putting nothing before God. Or to put it another way, clinging to no thing but God. As one commentator put it, this is putting your money, putting your money where your mouth is. Oh, I honor God. I sing his praises every Sunday. I sing those hymns. Oh. Well, wait a minute. He said, Let, show me that you honor me by the things, the stuff that you have. Because everything you have is a gift. Everything you have, you have received from me, the writer Paul to, to the Corinthians tells them. And it's a matter not only of putting nothing before God, it's a matter of giving God the first place and the best place. And that requires sacrifice. And so there's the matter of sacrifice, this honoring of the Lord with our substance and with the best of our things finds its greatest expression, I think, in that text that we saw in the adult class this morning, Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. Romans 12, verses 1 and 2. I urge you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies. Oh, there's some stuff for you. Doesn't get much more basic than that. To give your bodies 
a living and holy sacrifice acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what the will of God is. How does God want you to act? How does God want you to live? Here's his will for you. How are you going to understand it? It starts with the mind, but it affects the whole body and giving everything that is yours and you. Saying, it's all yours, Lord. What do you want to do with it? It's not mine. Honor the Lord from your wealth. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Fear the Lord and turn away from evil. Honor the Lord from your wealth. And the fourth part of the piety that is essential to this proverbial wisdom is found in verse 11. My son, do not reject the discipline of the Lord or loathe his reproof. Summarize this with, this with this phrase, submit to the Lord. Submit to the Lord. He talks about rejecting the discipline of the Lord, which can mean to cast it off, uh, to throw it away as though it were something to be discarded, to, to utterly reject it. To loathe something is to have a deep emotional rejection. So how would we cast off the discipline of the Lord? How would we reject his reproof? Now, discipline is the word for instruction. It can be the word child rearing or training. The Greek word used highlights that reality. So it's a general term about any kind of instruction that God is giving you. The word reproof specifically speaks of God dealing with your sin. When you have stepped out of line, when you have violated God's law and you need to be corrected. That is the word for reproof. It's a courtroom word that comes to you and says, you have been found out, you are being called to repent and change. What do we, how do we reject then this discipline? How do we loathe this reproof. Well, just think for a minute. What have you seen in the classroom? How do, how do students uh, reject the instruction of their teacher? Well, they, they roll their eyes and don't pay too much attention to what's being said. And so they neglect it or despise it. When we reject or cast away the discipline of the Lord, we can do that by by being depressed by what he has brought us, by being fretful at what he has brought us, by being impatient in what he has brought our way. The way he has chosen to discipline us, we say this is too hard, and we have hard thoughts of God. That's another way that we can reject or loathe his teaching of us. We can be like Jacob and, and look at life and say, it's been hard. My whole life has been nothing but pain and agony. And you're going to bereave me of my other son. Or we can be like Gideon. Oh, my Lord, if Jehovah is with us, why then has all this happened to us? Where are all his miracles which our fathers told us about, saying, Did not the Lord bring us out of Egypt? But now the Lord has abandoned us. And we harbor hard thoughts of him, and we don't like the way he's ordering things. We don't like the way he does things. He gives us a plant to cool us, and then he kills the plant. And Jonah gets angry at the Lord, despising his reproof. We can refuse to be comforted like the psalmist in Psalm 77 and verse 2. In the day of my trouble I sought the Lord. In the night my hand was stretched out without weariness. Here's the fourth aspect. How do you deal with God's dealings with you? How do you receive God's instructing of you, whether it's in just the normal circumstances of life or through the word of God that comes to you or through one of these counselors who points something out in your life or through God coming through his word or through one of those counselors or through experience around you to rebuke you for sin that's in your life. How do you receive that? 
The proverbial wisdom needed for daily life has this aspect to its piety. It embraces God's training methods. It embraces the wilderness. It embraces the rebukes. One of the most ridiculous things I ever heard was when I heard that teachers should no longer use red pens to mark their papers because it might hurt their, their students' feelings. I love red pens as a teacher. Ask any of my students. It gets their attention. I had a teacher write a red penned note on a paper that transformed my life back in college. If they had used green and nice gentle words, I probably would have rejected that paper. Now, I'm not, it's not the color so much, but brethren, the point is this. Are you going to embrace the way God deals with you in pointing out your sin? If you need to be corrected, if it's correction, then guess what? You should embrace that. It means you're wrong. You want to go through life saying one plus one equals six? Don't build a house for me. When God comes and says, no, that's sin, that's wrong, I want to correct you. He's re redirecting you to get you back on track. I love this verse I came across. I, I'd never seen it or never really stuck with me until studying Job chapter 5 and verse 17. I want to just turn there for this one verse because if you get anything, take this one home with you. Job chapter 5 and verse 17. Behold. Right before the Psalms. Job 5, 17. Behold, how happy is the man whom God reproves. So do not despise the discipline of the Almighty. Is that your heart toward the discipline, the instruction, the reproofs that God brings your way? Do you find yourself, oh, how happy and blessed I am that God has pointed this out, lest I should keep on in that path? Oh, what a blessed God I have that he would fill take the time to instruct me on this particular point that he might direct me better, that I might think more accurately about myself and my world. Oh, what a blessed man I am, a happy man. God has reproved me. What do you think of a friend who knows that you're walking towards something that's going to make you trip and fall? And he watches you until you do. It's either a joke, in which hopefully you go, ha, 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 or it's an unkindness that he allowed you to take that step that hurt you or could have hurt you. No, you bless the person who says, oh, uh, watch out, uh, there's something there in your way. You know, Oh, step back, there's a car coming. You don't want to get hit by it. You thank the people that correct you and direct you in this way. Oh, how happy is the man whom God reproves. We spend a good bit of time in the adult class looking at Jeremiah chapter 3 and many of the truths that were found there. But the man who does not reject who does not reject the discipline of the Lord or loathe his reproof is the man who embraces God's sovereign direction. And that's what Jeremiah did in Lamentations 3. He said in the midst of it all, the Lord's loving kindnesses indeed never cease. The Lord is good to those who wait for him, to the person who seeks him. It is good that he waits silently for the salvation of the Lord. It is good for a man that he should bear the yoke in his youth. Do you know what a yoke is? A yoke is something for doing work to direct you to do the right work and to carry the load. This is the one who is blessed, who learns to do this in his youth. And he goes on to speak about sitting with his mouth in the ashes 
and giving his cheek to the smiter and embracing it as from the Lord. Do you see the Lord's dealings with you as that which is good for you? It is good for me that I was afflicted that I may learn your statutes. Okay, I see that he's instructing me that I might better understand his regulations for me. Can you say with the psalmist, I know, O oh Lord, that your judgments are righteous and that in faithfulness you have afflicted me? In faithfulness. You were being faithful to me by afflicting me with this. You are helping me to overcome my self-confidence and my creature confidence by bringing me low. It is good. But the, but the psalmist, but excuse me, Solomon highlights here something else for us. My son, back to Proverbs chapter 3, my son, do not reject the discipline of the Lord or loathe his reproof. For when the Lord, for whom the Lord loves, he reproves, even as a father, a, the son in whom he delights. This fourth element of this piety that is essential to this proverbial wisdom says, this is God's loving care for me. God is assuring me that he delights in me by dealing with this in me. God is assuring me that I'm one of his children. I'm part of his people, part of his family. And the writer of Hebrews picks this up in Hebrews chapter 12 and expands upon how wonderful it is that God deals with us in disciplining us. For if he does not discipline us, you are illegitimate. But whom the Lord loves, he disciplines. And he does it for righteousness sake. Looking for wisdom. Wanting direction. Finding that way to direct yourself through the ordinary things of life. The ordinary daily activities of life. And you say, I need the wisdom that's going to help me make that decision that faces that ever ticking clock with death at the end. And I need something to help me through life to that point in that context. I need wisdom when I'm thinking about how do I relate to God and men and maintain their favor in a right way and maintain a good reputation. I need proverbial wisdom. I need wisdom to know the right path that I ought to take and to know that I'm on the right path when I take it. I need that wisdom when I'm facing those health decisions. This treatment, that treatment. This doctor, that doctor. I need this wisdom to help me to deal with the financial aspects of life and having enough to fill my family's bellies and to take care of them and meet my obligations. I need that wisdom to help me with those, those trials and difficulties that are from the hand of God that are pressing down upon me, directing me in painful ways. I need wisdom. And Solomon says, okay, listen to the ordinary agents of wisdom. Listen to those ordinary agents that God has put in your path. Parents, gray-haired individuals, people that have manifested that wisdom to be a good counselor. Listen to those ordinary agents that God has given you. Take and listen to the Word of God, ultimately where God speaks to us and as these counselors speak to you. But here's what you need, essential to such a proverbial wisdom. You must have this piety on a daily basis in the ordinary aspects of life, in all of those decisions. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Know Him at every point. Seek to draw near to Him and live with Him at your right hand. Place Him there. See Him there. And then fear the Lord. Recognize that He is to be given first place in the moral aspects of life. I am to live according to His law. 
I must avoid anything which contradicts his way, which is contradictory to his character. After all, I'm supposed to have mercy and truth, which are his characteristics marking me. How can I act in a way that's contrary to his character? I need to fear the Lord and turn away from every form of evil. Making those decisions about my bills, making those decisions about my healing, my treatments, I also need to honor the Lord from all of my substance. Lord, it's all yours. And I need to submit to the way he's dealing with me and embrace the way he's dealing with me. He may be dealing with others differently. God knows how weak I am. My life has been very easy. Some of you brethren have faced things I don't think, I don't know how I would face it. I haven't had to face it. But you have. God knows what you need. I'm convinced that the psalmist in Psalm 27, the Hebrew ought to read, I am convinced that I am seeing the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. I am convinced that what is right here, right now, is God's good hand upon me. That's embracing his discipline. Embracing his reproofs. Proverbial wisdom for daily life is characterized by piety. To go back to my phrase that I took from Derek Kidner, it is godliness in work clothes. Godliness in work clothes. And it's in that way that I can then anticipate that these things will be fulfilled in my life. I will know something of real, rich life. I will know something of having God smile upon me and getting along with those who are around me. I will know something of what it is to have a straight path. Now, brethren, that's one phrase I just want to highlight here because he's not saying to us, act this way and God will somehow give you perfect vision about exactly what the right decision is to make. He's not saying... Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not upon your own understandings. In all your ways, know Him. And somehow, through a premonition, through vision, through just a, a warm, fuzzy feeling, He'll make it abs go this way. Big voice. No, it's not going to happen. What He says is, trust Him in this way, and then when you make the decision, using all the ordinary means, that path will be the straight path for you. It will be God's perfect path for you. He will walk with you in it. Even if it proves that there's difficulties along the way. That's still the straight path. That's still the place you ought to be. It's the best path for you. That's why he chose it. That's why he directed you the way that he did. To put you on that very path. And then honor him with all your wealth, and he'll take care of those basic needs of life. All these blessings, and I haven't got time to address them all. Life and peace, this principle of spiritual and true life, those God walking with you, straightening that path, smoothing it as you walk along, the restoration of your health. If you avoid sin, you avoid the poison which destructs, self-destructs, there is health to be found there, spiritual health, vigor, the inner man being renewed day by day. There will be the provisions for the daily needs of life. God will take care of you. We can say with the psalmist that he'd never seen the righteous begging bread. Exactly what we do have will be exactly the provision that we need. I do want to just read this one quote from Matthew Henry because everybody quoted it. God shall bless you with an increase. Excuse me. He does not say your bags will be filled, but your barns. Not your wardrobe replenished, but your wine presses. God shall bless you with an increase of that which is for use, not for show or ornament. 
for spending and laying up, not for hoarding and laying up, excuse me, laying out, not for hoarding and laying up. Those that do good with what they have shall have more to do good with. If we make our worldly estates useful to our religion, used by our beliefs in God, we shall find our beliefs and faith in God very useful in the prosperity of our worldly affairs. Godliness has the promise of the life that now is and most of the comfort of it. We mistake if we think that giving will undo us and make us poor. No, giving for God's honor will make us rich. Because he who sows sparingly will reap sparingly. He who sows bountifully will reap bountifully. And for what reason? That he might have more to sow. He who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will supply and multiply your seed for sowing and increase the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in everything for all liberality, which through us is producing thanksgiving to God. And this kind of piety and this kind of proverbial wisdom for the daily decisions of life will give you this, the fresh assurance that God is your loving heavenly Father. We all face those daily difficult decisions. Where's the wisdom to make those decisions? Well, here's an essential part of it. Trust in the Lord. Fear the Lord. Honor the Lord. And do not reject the way he orders your life. And that's essential to the proverbial wisdom to making those challenging decisions in life. Well, there's many other principles in the book of Proverbs, but that, I believe, is the heart. For the ordinary course of life, using the ordinary means of life, godliness in work clothes. But you see, the Christian life is exactly the same in its living out as it was when we, the way we came in. And some of you who are looking for direction in life need to start here. Trust in the Lord Jesus Christ with all your heart. Fear God and turn away from evil. That means repent of your sins. Give up your love of sin and turn to God and trust in Him. And stop living for yourself. Stop honoring yourself above all others and honor God. Give Him His rightful place. Turn to Him and turn from every idol. Whatever it is you're living for, you need to let it go or you will never lay hold of God. And submit yourself entirely to God to take you and to mold you and to use you for his glory. Trust. Trust in the Lord. Fear the Lord. Honor the Lord. And do not despise his discipline. Or you will only have his discipline forever. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we plead with you that you would help us. Give us the proverbial wisdom that we need to live daily in your world. Help our brethren who are facing some of the most challenging circumstances of their lives. Be with them. Guide them. In your providence and in your loving care, manifest yourself to them. May they grow in their trust in you. May they continually fear you and flee from every evil. May they honor you with what you have given them. 
And Lord, help them to embrace your discipline. Help us all, O God, to act in this way to the glory of your name. We plead in Jesus' name. Amen.